Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Financial Foundations today. It's our second day. We're going to be talking about money and the Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, it's the Bank of Banks. It's the U.S. National Bank, if you will. It's the it's the source of money for the United States. Um, if you ever look at any of your uh, your paper money. They will all say Federal Reserve Bank on them somewhere. And the Federal Reserve Bank is responsible for something called monetary policy. Oops, that's the last class video. Monetary policy. Of course, you might guess having the word the root M-O-N-E in it, it's about money. Monetary policy is about how much cash is actually flowing throughout the economy. That's what the Federal Reserve Bank's main job is, to manage all that. So we'll come back to them in a minute, but we wanna talk about the functions of money. We all use money, right? Money, though, what what actually gets used as money has to meet certain requirements. And these are the three that are typically accepted as uh, measurements of whether or not something can be used as money. Money has to be a medium of exchange. It has to be a unit of account. It has to be a store of value. Anybody think of an example of something that's been used as money over, over the years? Okay, let me ask a different question. What do we use money for? Buying stuff. Yeah. What if we're uh, what if we're in Europe? We got euros. We got dollars. Right. You can exchange them. They're not always valued the same. Just like if you go to Japan, they got yen. You can. You can interchange these things. Uh, you ever, anybody ever gone to a swap meet, like a flea market? I'm sure I have. Okay. Do, do traders always use money? No. Don't have to. Cows for what? Harvesting. I think usually it's a slaughter, but for lunch, rather. For what? Sometimes for slaughter, but sometimes for other cows. Okay, did he ever trade them for uh, construction services? Or he needed, he needed a new barn so he could give somebody some cows? What I'm trying to get you to think about is it's an alternative way of paying for stuff. The barter system, trading, you got cows, you can trade that. They got milk, you know, they, can make, they can produce milk, they can produce obviously meat, uh, maybe even hide, things like that. If you go back in history, all kinds of stuff has been used. Yeah, yeah, you trade. There's a couple problems with the barter system, though. 
certainly cows would qualify as a medium of exchange. Okay, we can agree that cow has some value, so I can accept that if I give you something in return. This is the big problem with cows. How do you agree on what it's worth? What is the unit of account that you're going to say, okay, that cow is worth 10 hours of my labor to go help build a barn? Everybody's going to have a different definition of that. It's also not a very good store bag because cows get old, they don't produce as much, they die. You know, so it's not the same as having a hundred dollar bill. You know that hundred dollar bill is still going to be worth a hundred bucks if you put it in a jar in the ground and dig it up 20 years from now. It's still going to have a value. Even if there's inflation, you're still going to be able to use it to buy a hundred dollars worth of stuff at that at that point in time. The other big problem with the barter system is what they call portability. In the Old West, what they do, they have cattle drives. You know, there was the wide open ranges. And they, the cowboys would be out there and they'd be herding the cattle. They'd get them on a train somewhere to take them to Kansas City or Chicago or someplace else. And in exchange, they'd get, you know, lumber and nails and you know whatever other stuff they needed guns for instance but that portability portability that means they're not very portable some societies historically have used stone circular stones for money for money Imagine trying to carry around <laughs> stones and getting weighed down with, okay, everybody's going to agree in this little village that these stones this size are worth a certain amount, stones this size are worth something else. It's confusing. So that's why in, in modern society, people have generally decided that these factors are the ones that are important for before something can be used as money. So if you look under the medium of exchange, you get some clarification on, on how something we're gonna call money has some purchasing power. It's gotta meet all of these. You got to be able to use it to value assets in common. Everybody's got to agree that uh, $100 is $100. Gold, diamonds, things like that, those fluctuate in value. You get people with different opinions about different value. It's not, it's a common asset, but you can't come to an agreement on what it actually is valued at. Constant utility just means you can always use it. Any store in America, you're going to be able to use those US dollars to buy whatever you need. You got to have a low cost of preservation. Dollars, paper money lasts a long time. I don't know if we'll get to see it in this particular video or not, but I'm going to show you about the Fed. But they, they <laughs> some of the tests that they put our money through, you'd be surprised. They wad it up, they crush it, they put it in acid, they, they drop it in gasoline, they do it all, they do all this kind of stuff and they unwind it and the bill is still good. It, it's, it's very durable, but that doesn't cost much to preserve it. You put it in your wallet, put it in an envelope, put it under your bed, put it in the, in the jar in the, in the ground. It doesn't cost anything to preserve those dollars. Transportability. What I was just talking about, the visibility. You take that hundred dollars, it'd be five twenties, it'd be a hundred ones, you can divide it up, you still got a hundred. You gotta be able to divide it. Think about a cow. You're gonna be able to take that cow and 
Yeah, I know, but it, it, you gotta have the slaughterhouse to be able to do that. You know, you're not gonna go down to the, the town square and you know buy beads and blankets and stuff and chop up a cow to give somebody to paint. It's not practical. High market value in relation to volume and weight. Well, certainly a hundred dollar bill qualifies for that. Hundred dollar bill doesn't hardly weigh anything. And doesn't take up a lot of space. Recognizability and resistance to counterfeiting are the last two requirements in order for something to function as a medium of exchange. I think everybody is, is probably pretty good at recognizing what US currency looks like. Resistance to counterfeiting has become even more important in current society, when you think about scanners, high-tech computers, uh, you know, high quality, you can get a, a color printer at home now for next to nothing and put out some very high quality color prints of something. The thing that makes U.S. currency so hard to counterfeit nowadays, a couple of things, the, the number one thing though is the paper. I don't, I don't think I've ever held a counterfeit bill, but you could you could literally tell by the, the feel of the paper that the bill is made of that it's fake. Because only the US Treasury gets that particular kind of paper. It's some kind of mixture of cotton and paper and I don't know what else, but it's got a certain texture. The big ones feel more flat. Uh, I don't know. Like I something's used to, uh, I used to work one time we had a uh, counterfeit hundred. Yeah. And I could I could tell someone a lot whether it's a bunch of they feel more plastic. They're weird feeling. Like, sometimes they can feel more plastic, but sometimes they can feel more paper and more brittle. Oh yeah. Like you can destroy them easily. But they're they're weird. After that incident we got those little lights that you have to shine through a hundreds to check if they're legit. Yeah. They don't have that little invisible seal that they're fake. They will usually tell them that they go. And you, you touched on one of the other things that has been done with US currency to prevent counterfeiting is, is that it's a UV light or some kind of light that you can shine on and something will show up that you can't see to the naked eye. There's also, if you see a, a, a clerk hold a bill up to the light, there's a little uh, a strip that's in. Embedded, embedded in the bill. Um, and if you've ever seen somebody pull out a marker and you know just do a little quick dab of a marker on the bill, that's a special kind of ink that people have been given, businesses have been given that will change color if the bills are fake. So the other thing that the Fed has done is they've changed the design a lot. You know, every so often they're going to change the design. I try to keep one. <laughs> Sorry, that so resistance counterfeiting is a huge deal. Uh, that and I'm glad you brought up your example about getting a counterfeit bill at on the job. I will say a lot of people who will pay for stuff with counterfeit bills, some of them don't even realize what they. Yeah, I believe that. I believe that's true. There's some people who like intentionally make them for use, and there's people who have made them for use and they've gotten out and they've circulated. And if someone's just come across it or just paid with it, they have no idea that it's fake. Well, the only thing, only situation like that that I personally have been involved in, I was at Kroger, young lady, probably 17, working the cash register, just opened the, the line, really busy. Some guy in front of me wanted to pay for one 20 ounce Dr. Pepper with a hundred dollar bill. And the girl says, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have the change for that right now. And this guy's acting kind of weird. He's looking around, he's looking like a little nervous. And I'm like, you know, I got a basket full of stuff and stand there waiting. 
I just opened my drawer, so I, you know, I got to get the manager to give me change, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, just tell the guy to go to the office to break the bill. She didn't do that. So later on, I'm like, there's no way that that guy was legitimately paying for one bottle of pop with a real $100 bill. He had to be trying to get his $97 of change back in real money. For a counterfeit bill, he was trying to pass. This poor girl had no idea. So I wrote the Kroger company afterwards. I said, you guys need to inform your cashiers what to do when this comes up. But anyway, side story. So second part required to be money is it has to be a unit of account. It has to be something that can measure. It has a standard to it. You can divide it up without losing the value. That's my example of taking a hundred, putting it into twenties or fives or tens or any combination of, of US currency. It's still a hundred dollars. You can still buy a hundred dollars worth of stuff. I'm gonna give you the example of precious metals like gold. We'll see in the video that gold's booming business in a lot of companies, parts of the country, got people standing out with the sign, you know, we buy gold, which is pawn shops. And stuff gets melted down, it's no longer coins. It, it's gonna go for the, the market value or whatever that is for that day. So the third thing is this has to, money has to be a store of value. Still got to maintain its value over time. Now, some inflation is a good thing. Uh, countries that have runaway inflation, no, it's not good. You know, some countries like Venezuela and some you know, third world countries, so you might have you know, 50% inflation a month. Um, you know, they're having a different economic crisis than anything we've ever dealt with. The U.S. inflation rates only about 2% a year for the last, I don't know, 20 years. It's pretty good, especially if you owe somebody money. Because in the future, you're going to pay that loan back with value dollars that are slightly less valuable. But that's just the way that it goes. People in economic terms want to see some inflation, but not too much. So if you're negotiating with your boss to get a raise, you probably need to pay attention to what the current inflation rate is or what the cost of living index is right now. Because if the inflation rate is 2% and you're only getting a 2% raise, you're just staying even. If you're not getting any raise, you're actually falling behind because now you have a little bit less buying power. So preferably, if I can get 4 or 5% or higher, then you're staying ahead of the inflation. So whatever it is, it's got to maintain its value. So that, that handout is in here for those three things specifically. So what I'm gonna to try to do here is give you one viewpoint of the Federal Reserve Bank. And then we're gonna come back and look at a National Geographic video that actually goes inside Federal Reserve Bank and talks about some of the structure. Because not everybody's a big fan of the banking system and how the Federal Reserve Bank actually does its business. But it's pretty much, it's pretty common the, the way that it's structured for banking throughout the world. If you remember Schoolhouse Rock, this is obviously modeled after that schoolhouse shock.
Let's say the United States needs money. Instead of issuing their own United States notes backed by their own credit, they issue treasury bonds. They then sell these bonds to the Federal Reserve, which buys them with money they created out of thin air. The money that the Fed created then goes to the U.S. The U.S. then pays interest on the money that the Fed lent to the Treasury. So to clarify, the Fed creates money from nothing, loans that money to the U.S., and then charges interest on that money. What this means is that there is never and will never be enough money in circulation or in existence to pay back that debt. We as a country, as well as private citizens, are forever enslaved by debt with no way of ever paying it off. Now, when the Federal Reserve buys bonds on Wall Street, the major financial firms that have been selected as dealers deposit the proceeds at their own banks. Fed rules require banks to keep 10% of their deposits in reserve, but the bank is free to issue loans equal to the remaining 90%. Let's say the Federal Reserve buys a $1,000 bond. After putting away 10% of their reserves, they are then able to loan out 90% or $900. Since the original $1,000 is still on deposit, the $900 in loan proceeds is more new money, money created out of nothing. A total of $1,900 of new money is now available in the economy. Now, the person that took the $900 loan spends that money. The payee then deposits the $900 into their bank account, and once again, reserves and deposits increase. This process goes on and on until that original $1,000 bond, which is created from nothing, becomes $10,000, making this one full-fledged debt machine while also devaluing the dollar. The more money that is out in the economy, the more the value decreases. There's no wonder that since the implementation of the Federal Reserve in 1913, the dollar has lost over 95% of its value. The U.S. dollar will eventually be destroyed due to an overwhelming financial crisis, and a globalist-run monetary authority will come along to save the debt. And much like the Fed pretends that its goal is to prevent another Great Depression, the global currency will pledge to prevent another financial crisis, thus putting more power into the hands of a few and enslaving humanity that much more. Some pretty strong words. Sounds terrible, doesn't it? Enslaving humanity. Wow. Well, that, that's clearly a time of, I would call it an extreme opinion or extreme position. But it is part of the way the U.S. deals with monetary policy. And the banks, the one thing that that video does describe correctly is what's called fractional reserve banking. The Fed has only two ways to manage the money supply. One way is by interest rates. The bank needs money they can go to the Fed and borrow it. When the Fed is loaning out money at very low rates, lots of money is available. It's easy for banks to go get money. You'll hear that talked about as the prime rate a lot. The other way that they control monetary policy is through these reserve requirements. Right now, banks only have to keep 10% of the cash that's on deposit in the vault at their location. So, for instance, if all of us uh, bank at the same place, say Chase Bank here nearby, and all of our uh, deposits total of $20 million, that'd be nice, but I know it's unrealistic. Um, the bank would only have to keep $2 million cash on hand. That's 10% of 20 million. What do they do with the rest of the money? We 
give you a car loan, give you a house loan, issue you a credit card, maybe student loans, maybe some debt consolidation loans. The bank loans that out, they charge you interest. They make money by charging you more interest than what they can get the money for from the Fed. That's, what, that's how banks make money. That's why on a savings account, they pay so little right now. So the reserve requirement, if they lower the reserve requirement, the bank's going to have even more money to loan out. If they raise the reserve requirement, that means the bank's got to hold more back. So what if I'm a big depositor of our $20 million, let's say $5 million of it's mine, and I go in there and I want to take all my cash out. Bank doesn't have that sitting there. It's two million. That's all they got. Well, they they're going to go to their other branches, or maybe they go back to the Fed. Say one of our depositors wants all their money in cash, and they have to have 24, 48 hours to produce it. But that's just the way the system works. And they would either get the money from the Fed directly, or like I said, go to one of the other branches. You know, Chase has got lots of banks. They could pull it from another branch, perhaps. You know, gosh, that'd be great for if one of us are in that position someday to go in and request that amount of money in cash that we could take with us. But it's not realistic, probably. But that's the way that it works. So this next video is more about the structure of the Fed and what they do for the country as a whole. So I mentioned before that this, this video is a National Geographic video. So it's uh, a little bit more even handed, not, not nearly as um, Opinionated. This is just sort of talking about the system and what they do at the Fed. This is $20 million of cash right here. Here's three hundred thousand dollars in single, thirty million dollars in hundred dollar bills. Whether it's cash, gold, or digital bits, we all know that money makes the world go round. And what that money is worth depends on trust. Trust in engines that power it all won't fail. I'm Jake Ward. For the first time, National Geographic is going to take you inside the system. Places that you're not allowed to bring the camera, straight into the vaults of the world's largest stash of what you want, need, and bust your butt to get money. One of the places that truly controls money is the Central Bank of the United States, the Federal Reserve. They count it, store it, move it, inflate it, deflate it, destroy, stabilize, lend, and buy it, and make a profit off of it. But above all, they protect it. And it's not just cash. For over 80 years, armored vehicles have navigated Manhattan's narrow streets, carrying millions and sometimes billions in gold deposits in and out of the one Federal Reserve Bank trusted enough to guard almost one quarter of the world's entire gold supply. Something seems to be wrong with the... Uh... last session. Some people are saying they can't get on. <laughs> 